Hello humans and other life forms. I don't normally talk on this channel, but today I have something a little bit different to share with you all. Um, what you're about to see is essentially a explanation or exploration of a, a an approach to music making that I've been employing for a few years now. And if I think back on it, I've really been developing for my entire life. So before we get into it, there's a few things I want to cover first. One is that I use a lot of relatively obscure terminology, and in order to avoid confusion, uh, I've put a glossary in the description that will hopefully make things a bit easier to parse. I'm also going to include all of the academic literature and music I reference as well. Finally, before we get into it, I've never made this type of video before, and I'm probably not going to be doing so very much or ever again. Um, so if you have questions or comments or concerns or philosophical ramblings, please, you know, hit me up and, uh, I'll try to respond as best I can. So without further ado, there you go. Things and stuff. What I'm calling gestural instrumentality is, in my conception, a methodology of composition and improvisation, as well as a kind of embodied realization of music theory. A way of seeing the relationships between musician, instrument, and theory that sidesteps the challenges presented by more typical approaches when taken to their furthest limits. It's possible and even probable that you have made use of this concept before if you're a musician of some experience or expertise. I have serious doubts it is at all a novel idea in its fundamental form. However, I cannot find any literature or educational materials that formalize and apply it in the way that I am attempting to do with this video. That is to say, in a way that is simultaneously agnostic to instrument and musical tradition musical tradition here meaning tuning system in addition to theoretical framework and performance technique. I also want to be clear that my intention is not to develop a prescription for this concept. Instead, my aim is to provide a framework with which one can imbue what are most often subconscious behaviors with a sense of intentionality that will aid anyone who makes use of it in accomplishing their creative goals. It doesn't need to, nor do I think it should be, rigid and inflexible. The strength and robustness of the idea lies in adopting it as one of many interconnected modalities that one employs in the act of music making. That is not to say I am trying to make this an all-encompassing treatise on the idea. My goal is to simply define my terms and provide a jumping off point for further exploration, preferably as a collaboration between peers. I am not an academic, but a musician first and foremost, and as such, I don't have the resources to give a thorough and complete analysis. I hope whoever may be watching this sees these inevitable gaps as opportunities to develop their own ideas in this area. I've tried to structure this in as coherent and logical a progression as possible, but due to the interdependence of the aspects that form this concept, a degree of jumping back and forth is necessary. My hope is that this helps convey that one should be conceptualizing the relationships between the various things I will be touching on in as three-dimensional a way as possible. There is also an element of repetition, both because in repeating myself I hope to obtain a better grasp of the concept in my own mind, but also because I feel that repetition is an undervalued pedagogical tool. Sometimes rephrasing an idea after explaining a related one is more powerful than simply going back and rereading or rewatching a previous section with new information. All of this is to say that I hope to turn my weaknesses as an essayist into strengths by acknowledging and using them with intention. I'd also like to preemptively clarify some potential confusion by returning to an old adage every musician has heard some variation of. 
Music is about listening. This is usually said to remind ourselves and our peers that the intellectualizations of music we adopt and engage in are ultimately subservient to the most powerful tools we have, our senses. We remind ourselves of this because it is sometimes easy to get lost in abstraction and lend too much credence to theory. While it is less common to fall into that trap than I think is generally believed, it's also not an entirely unreasonable fear. I don't want to give the impression that gestural instrumentality is at all an invitation to turn our ears off. In fact, it's precisely the opposite. Listening starts as a somatic process. Our senses take in stimuli that is then translated into cognitive information, and then finally we filter that through ideological lenses to intellectualize our sensory experiences. I'm obviously being reductive, but I bring this up because it can be easy to forget. As in an expert musician, this process is as near instant as we can get in human terms, which gives the illusion of innateness. Now on to the topic at hand. My goals for this video are as follows. First, I'll give a general overview of how this is distinct from other practices and theories, what I believe the aims of this school of thought should be, the musical concepts that do and do not fall under its purview, as well as why I think it's important. Second, I'll explain and define my usage of the word instrument and instrumentality, how the form of an instrument influences musical gesture and musical thought, as well as how gestural instrumentality can be used to create an approach to playing that is both backwards and forwards compatible with regards to musical tradition and instrument form. I will also explain and define my usage of the term instrument form, which includes more than just physical dimensions and materials. Third, I'll explain and define my usage of the word gesture and gestural, how it is informed by and also departs from previous definitions and usages, how it interacts with music theory as it is commonly thought of in the traditional sense, how it informs composition and instrument form, and how we can begin to approach it from the perspective of gestural instrumentality. Fourth, I'll explore how these two ideas intersect and interact with each other, as well as how they fit into the greater musical ecosystem as I see it. Before I do, however, there is some ground I want to briefly cover in regards to prerequisite knowledge that I feel is necessary. For the purposes of brevity, I'm going to assume that you have at least a basic grasp of the following theories and concepts. Western European common practice tonal theory. This includes, but is not limited to, intervals, triadic chord construction, diatonic scales and modes, functional harmony, chord extensions, etc. Post-tonal theory. This includes, but is not limited to, set theory, atonalism, serialism, alternate interval class, chord construction, chordal, quintal, secundal, and so on, etc. Instrument design, meaning a general understanding of the terminology and differences between instrument designs and how they have been used historically. For example, the piano keyboard's seven white keys representing natural notes, with the five black keys representing accidentals, the guitar fretboard's isomorphism, and so on, as well as a general awareness of the fundamental techniques of the most commonly used instrument layouts. Psychoacoustics, specifically, the harmonic series, the distinction between consonance and dissonance versus concordance and discordance, timbre and context in relation to consonance and dissonance, phase, etc. Zen harmony, also known as micro slash macro tonality. Say it with me, this includes, but is not limited to, intervallic ratios, sense, just intonation, equal division, MOS scale construction, non-octave equaves, primodality, etc. Music history, understanding the rough outlines of the development of Western European musical traditions, including classical, jazz, blues, rock, hip-hop, etc., and how they relate to and differ from each other, as well as the equally rich traditions from other cultures, Indian, Turkish, Eastern European, Chinese, Indonesian, and so on. Not all of these ideas will be addressed directly in this video, but I feel that they are all positioned in a complex web of relationships with each other, such that understanding one in ways both direct and indirect deepens one's understanding of the others. This all flows and merges downstream into informing gestural instrumentality, in some ways that are obvious and some that are vague to the point of being inscrutable even to me.
put it simply, gestural instrumentality, referred to as GI from now on, is an approach to music making that primarily focuses on the physical interaction between musician and instrument, not just as an incidental means to an end, as merely execution, as I think we often conceive of it as, sometimes implicitly and sometimes explicitly, but as a or even the main engine of creation. Now, it's obviously true that physicality already plays a central role in music making. One can't play a chord on a guitar or piano via telepathy, after all. However, this concept is different in that it's not necessarily about changing how we move or the sonic consequences of our movements, but instead how we think about moving. It requires a reframing of mentality. There are some nuances to how I think about physical motion in this paradigm that will be expanded upon in the section on gesture. For now, I'd like to explain how GI borrows from previous theorizations, but more importantly, how it mutates them. For example, in Musical Gesture in Analysis, Gesture Class as a Formal Structure, Anthony Calkins describes the goals of his thesis in the following quotes from the abstract. Quote, I examine notions of musical gesture and their possible compositional and analytical applications. As a point of departure, I provide a provisional definition of musical gesture. I then posit a theory of gesture classification that draws on language used in post-tonal set theory in order to develop the formalized structures of gesture classes and gesture class sets." Unquote. Quote, through each of these brief case studies, I aim to provide vocabulary with which to describe music that can be seen as gestural in conception or construction, as well as insight into possibilities for new forms based on explorations of gesture as a formal musical element." Unquote. While I will be borrowing the terms gesture class and gesture class set, my focus will differ from Calkins in that my primary concern is in creating a mental framework that allows the new forms of composition and improvisation he mentions to be accessible alongside the expanded palette of sonorities provided by Zen harmonic theory, without the need to redesign or augment already existing instrument form. This is also important for more easily facilitating polysystemic music. While we're on the subject of instrument form, another area where my conception differs is the emphasis on instrument form as the critical modulating and guiding factor on gestural boundaries and construction. To reiterate on what I said earlier, GI is primarily a dialectic of human physical movement, actual or simulated, and designed musical objects. Gestural analysis of music and gestural music composition are also not new ideas. Artists like Mari Kimura, Imogen Heap, and Carlos Delgado have used motion tracking and MIDI technologies to create multimedia gestural performances that incorporate digital synthesis, live voice recording, video, and in Kimura's case, the traditional violin. While in the academic world, theorists such as the previously mentioned Anthony Calkins, alongside others like Michael Berry, Robert Hatton, Arnie Cox, Lawrence Zibikowski, Candace Brower, and David Lidov have attempted to systematize and fold gesture into musical analysis. Going back even further from these modern explorations, we can think of conducting as, among other things, a gestural performance, with the orchestra as a kind of meta-instrument. Ryuichi Sakamoto's performance of Blue with the Tokyo Philharmonic can serve as an exemplary demonstration of this. Let's first touch on gestural music itself. For both Delgado and Heap, their applications of gesture involve using modern motion tracking technology to essentially design new gestural instruments. These instruments can be thought of as existing on an evolutionary tract with similar historical instruments such as the theremin and orchestra meta instrument. For Kimura, her approach is more about giving the gestures already inherent to playing the violin additional sound production capability via roughly the same motion tracking technology as Delgado and Heap, just through a different artistic lens. These approaches are extremely valuable and interesting in their own right, but I bring them up to highlight how they contrast with GI. While they use externalities to further emphasize the role of gesture in music, 
GI is about internalizations that root musicality in somatic expressions and experiences. As for the scholarly pursuits in this area, the scenario is similar. The contributions made by theorists, both the ones I've mentioned and the ones I haven't, are important theoretical expansions, but they are for the most part theoretical. GI is meant to be praxis. A praxis of what? To what ends? The genesis of this concept was that I wanted to find a solution to the problem that our current most popular and widely available instrument forms are poorly suited to Zenharmonic music. For some, the answer lies in building new instrument forms like the Lumitone and Linstrument. However, for me, this answer also carries its own faults. On the practical side, the steep monetary investment required for many of these new instruments is often prohibitive for the average working class musician. Because of this, an unquantifiable amount of creative ideas are left unexpressed, possibly forever. Even putting economic concerns aside, there is still the issue of how instrument form places and defines inescapable boundaries on one's musical thought. This will be expanded on in the section on instrument. These are just a few of the issues that I wish to tackle through GI, even if the best that can be done is to slightly chip away at them. To put it another way, the initial goal was to find an answer to the question of how do we make our already existing instruments play nice with Zen harmony? This is where the physicality and embodiment of gesture comes in. It's about shifting our focus away from prefigurative cognition-based methods of music making towards the in-the-moment interactions between human and instrument. An instrument's form provides both a platform from which to create and the boundaries that define that creation's identity. Gesture provides the means of actualizing the instrument's sonic potential. In a traditional perspective, these things are most often provided by theoretical concepts like key signatures, functional harmony, serialism, voice leading, and so on. In GI, common practice and post-tonal theory may have their place as post-hoc analytical tools if the need arises, but they are not creative platforms in their own right. With all that in mind, there are some things that are outside the scope of this essay. The first of which that I feel must be addressed is rhythm and percussion instruments. This is, in my view, a harmonic concept first and foremost. The role of rhythm is as a kind of musical carbon that is present and structurally defining for all of harmony, in the same way that the element carbon is for life on Earth. That's not to say that one couldn't explore rhythm through the lens of GI, just that I won't be doing so for the time being. Though I will briefly say that my intuition is that drums and other percussion instruments are the most naturally GI aligned in their common usage. I'd also like to offer that perhaps the best entrance point into rhythmic GI is using harmonic beating or LFO modulations for structuring rhythms. As an addendum to the previous point with regards to common practice and post-tonal theory, while GI can be used for tonal music, it would be negligent to not mention that it is certainly much better suited for post-tonal frameworks and expressions. The techniques that one employs when pursuing GI trend towards creating musical units that would traditionally be considered dissonant in most cases. That being said, I will be operating mostly from a post-tonal standpoint. Previously mentioned, the usage of the term instrument form in this essay is more layered than it initially appears. While it does include physical dimensions and materials used in manufacturing, it also includes the mental construct of a given instrument that its user holds in their mind. This construct will be unique to each individual as it is informed by one's personal experiences with the instrument in question. This doesn't just mean their own playing of the instrument but also hearing how others play it, talk about it, and the environmental context for both. For example, listening to a virtuoso flamenco guitarist in person as a part of an audience leaves one with a very different sensory imprint than listening to a recording via earbuds on the bus. At the same time as each individual's construct of an instrument's form will be unique, it will also share many elements in common with others' constructs. 
This is because it will be informed by an instrument's practical and aesthetic history, its cultural context. For new instruments like Imogen Heap's Mimu gloves or the various different isomorphic keyboard likes, like the previously mentioned Lumitone, Linstrument, etc., this is an ongoing process. The current pioneers in the playing of these instruments will likely have a greater influence on the cultural context they inhabit than those that come after. Similarly to how linguistic relativity posits that the language one speaks can train or emphasize certain modes of general cognition, I posit that the instrument or instruments that one plays can do the same for certain kinds of musicality, both in the sense of encouraging understanding of certain musical concepts, for example, isomorphism makes thinking in terms of scale or chord shape much easier, which facilitates transposition, and in discouraging others. Though I cannot provide any empirical evidence for this outside of anecdotes, I don't believe this to be an especially outlandish claim. It's not uncommon amongst musicians to talk about guitar player brain or drummer brain in casual conversation, after all. I will be calling this instrument relativity from now on. I strongly posit that this will also carry over onto the new instrument forms that are coming into their own today. This is for several reasons. One, there are just inherent boundaries that human anatomy places on instrument design. We obviously are only in possession of five fingers on each hand and four limbs in total, as I'm sure you are aware. Two, many of these new instruments are adapting the underlying design logics of previous instruments, meaning that the instrument relativity that these logics build will be to some degree a vestigial characteristic in the new forms. Three, Music pedagogy in the Western European tradition will most likely remain largely oriented around the most common traditional instruments. This orientation makes developing pedagogical tools for new instrument forms difficult as they will have to exist comparatively with or as adaptations of what is already well established. I believe instrument relativity also affects the types, qualities, and patterns of gesture one gravitates towards. This can translate from primary to secondary instrument, with the degree of translation depending on the similarity between the two. For an obvious example, electric guitar and bass have so much overlap that common derisive statements to make about a bassist are that they play like a guitar player, or are really a guitar player who's being forced to play bass because someone has to. Even when the scenario is arbitrarily rephrased to be between, say, guitar and clarinet, where fewer of the physical logics transfer from one to the other, musical instincts still do. Of course, this problem only needs be such in musical situations that demand that musicians adhere strictly to their historical roles. It can be overcome with practice and experience, but in GI this isn't always necessary. Instead, we can think of this phenomenon as an opportunity for relatively novel expressions and approaches. In addition to gesture class and gesture class set, I'd like to introduce a new term, gesture mode, which I will be defining as a physical territory stemming from instrument form that gesture classes and sets exist within. This is distinct from what we typically think of as a mode in a musical context in that it is completely agnostic to any theoretical convention of harmony. On a guitar, Playing along one string, as well as the inverse of playing across multiple strings, can be thought of as just two of the possible gesture modes of that instrument. While in most scenarios, a guitarist will be effectively mixing modes just by playing the standard shapes they know, by breaking one's thinking down into these base elements, we can re-examine how these shapes are constructed from a physical, rather than theoretical, perspective, allowing the construction of chord and scale shapes to be devised and explored within a GI framework. We'll return to the idea of gesture mode and delve into its potential use cases in the section on gesture. Instrument relativity and gesture mode are just two of the constituent elements that make up instrumentality. Another that requires further discussion is the role of what Arnie Cox calls the mimetic hypothesis in the papers Embodying Music, Principles of the Mimetic Hypothesis, and The Mimetic Hypothesis and Embodying Musical Meaning. Cox explains, quote, 
The initial premise of the hypothesis is that part of how we comprehend music is by way of a kind of physical empathy that involves imagining making the sounds we are listening to. This is a special case of the general human proclivity to understand one another via imitation, which we can refer to as mimetic cognition or mimetic comprehension, where mimetic is used in the manner specified below, hence the mimetic hypothesis, end quote. Quote, the core of the mimetic hypothesis holds that one, we understand sounds in comparison to sounds we have made ourselves, and that two, this process of comparison involves tacit imitation or mimetic participation, which in turn draws on prior embodied experience of sound production. End quote. To state the obvious, this is already a feature of instrument under my definition. However, the mimetic hypothesis also has a substantial presence in instrumentality from another angle as well, that being the human body being a kind of instrument in and of itself. Also not a factual claim, but a conceptual and or methodological one using the mimetic hypothesis as a foundation. In GI, we view the human body as an instrument in the sense that it is a component of a meta-instrument that is created by interfacing with a given inanimate object, whether it be explicitly designed for musical use like a saxophone, or are imbued with musicality through use like glass bottles filled with water. This framing of our physical dimensions is useful for enabling our ability to build gestural vocabulary and fluency. Now, the sound of a door being locked or a snake hissing can be opportunities to expand one's musical palette by using the body to translate mundane sounds into musical gesture. The same can be true for non-auditory experiences and actions, such as seeing someone wave hello across a busy street or pointing towards the restroom in a noisy bar. By internalizing the speed, length, contour, etc., of a sound or movement, we can then musicalize its abstract form, its sensory imprint, its gestalt into a tangible sonic object via a cognitive and somatic translation that is informed by the mimetic hypothesis within instrumentality. In the same way that we often translate musical sound into motion and mundane sound, for example, air drumming or using an explosion hand gesture and or vocal imitation to convey the strength of a musical moment, only in reverse, translating mundane sound and motion into musical sound and motion. Finally, a most critical thread that runs through everything I've said so far in this section is borrowed from cognitive linguistics, metaphoric cross-domain mapping. Given that I am no expert in this particular branch of science, I won't attempt to explain this notion in tremendous depth, only that which is sufficient for the purposes of this video. I recommend reading Candace Brower's paper, A Cognitive Theory of Musical Meaning, for a more detailed look into the concept in a musical context. In Metaphor and Music Theory, Reflections from Cognitive Science, Lawrence M. Zbikowski outlines the basics in the following quotes. Quote, Metaphor was a basic structure of understanding through which we conceptualize one domain, typically unfamiliar or abstract, the target domain, in terms of another, most often familiar and concrete, the source domain. Unquote. Quote, Fundamental to the theory of metaphor that sprang from Lakoff and Johnson's work is a distinction between conceptual metaphors and linguistic metaphors. A conceptual metaphor is a cognitive mapping between two different domains. A linguistic metaphor is an expression of such a mapping through language." Unquote. How this manifests in musical context is fairly easy to intuitively grasp, to the point where it borders on self-evident. Zubikowski directs his focus towards how we conceptualize pitch relationships using the metaphor of vertical spatial relationships. But we can also see cross-domain mapping appear in common discourse around rhythm, dynamics, and timbre as well. We play ahead or behind the beat. We articulate a note as hard or soft. A synth patch can be sharp or dull, and so on. And in doing so, we make use of what are called image schemas. An image schema being a preconceptual structure based in embodied experience that organizes and defines the metaphorical conceptual models we use in cognition. 
There are many interesting nuances at play that I will briefly mention only to acknowledge that they exist and must be considered in order to fully grasp the idea. The role of cultural conditioning, different cultures use of different image schemas, the invariance principle, quote, metaphorical mappings preserve the cognitive topology, that is the image schema structure of the source domain in a way consistent with the inherent structure of the target domain, unquote and how multiple image schemas are often used in tandem when referring to complex topics, to name a few. Cross-domain mapping, in my view, is the glue that binds the disparate components of instrumentality, and by extension, gesture, into a greater whole. We can find it in how we mentally construct instrument form and define usage within a given musical tradition, Understanding the differences between a trombone and a mandolin is not only literally sensorial, it is also derived out of metaphor, which both is cyclically fed by and feeds into our somatic experiences of instrument. The same is true with regard to the application of the mimetic hypothesis within GI. The act of somatically translating sound and gesture possesses intrinsic metaphoricity that is of critical importance to it. Attempting to literally translate a sensory experience into music is not only impossible, but undesirable as well, as the target of this practice is the experience of sound, the gestalt that escapes literal linguistic description and understanding. Simulation is not the goal, evocation is. Metaphor is more descriptive, more precise, more real. Musical gesture is typically seen as having a few different components and definitions. For some, the primary feature that separates a musical gesture from a musical motive is that a gesture is evocative of the physical motion used to create it. However, this cannot sufficiently account for the virtual gestures that constitute a significant portion of modern music. An ascending 16th note arpeggio does not necessarily need to have been born out of a pianist's fingers anymore. It can just be programmed into a Dawes piano roll via the clicks of a mouse or trackpad. So, for my purposes, I'll be tweaking the definition so that a musical gesture is evocative of a possible physical gesture, real or virtual. In The Importance of Bodily Gesture in Sofia Gabay de Luna's Music for Low Strings, Michael Berry borrows from the study of gesture in linguistics to further distinguish practical movement from expressive movement. In his own words, quote, Not all movements made while speaking constitute gestures. We must also distinguish between gestures that accompany speech and movements responsible for producing speech sounds. Any movement of the lips and tongue of the vocal folds, for example, are not typically considered gestures. That is, they are not marked for significance by the interpreter. These speech-producing movements are akin to what I am calling practical movements in musical performance, unquote. Quote, a musical gesture is a movement of the body that is intended to produce sound or to convey non-musical, non-sonic information to the audience about the performance, unquote. While this distinction is no doubt useful for analytical purposes, I will instead be treating both practical and expressive movements as simply two aspects of gesture. I will be doing the same with both the physical and virtual interaction with an instrument and the sonic unit it generates. As in both cases, both aspects feed into and give rise to each other. Likewise, my focus will be on gesture from the perspective of the performer and or composer, while Barry's is more on the perspective of the listener. To sum up, anytime I use the word gesture or its derivatives, the meaning will contain the plurality of actions a human being undertakes to create a musical passage, phrase, or moment, as well as the sonic object that is or the objects that are produced. To begin our exploration of gesture within the context of GI, we'll start with a hypothetical. A standard piano layout, 7 white, 5 black, with 19 EDO mapped onto it. This immediately presents one of the main problems that GI aims to fix, as mentioned earlier. 
Because we now have 19 pitch classes instead of the 12 the keyboard was designed for, the geometry of the instrument no longer makes sense. It is discordant with the pitch space we're working within. Traveling up from what is normally the C3 key to what should be the C4 key no longer produces the expected consonant ditave, octave, but instead the dissonant interval 13, which I'll be notating as 1319, with the bass frequency being 119, of 19 EDO which is 757.8 cents. This makes playing the instrument unwieldy and unintuitive. Even something as foundational as making the simple stretch to play the ditave with one hand becomes impossible, as it now entails reaching from C3 to G4. Another example of the same problem, playing 19 EDO's approximation of a major 7th chord requires 119, 719, 1219, and 1819. C3, G flat 3, B3, and F4. While it is possible to use standard practice methodologies to retrain one's musical intuition and muscle memory to the new scale and chord shapes presented in this scenario, it is inefficient and difficult due to the intrinsic conflict between instrument form and tuning system. It would also need to be repeated to a greater or lesser degree depending on the specifics if one ever switched to a different tuning system. Now, let's employ a GI mindset to resolve this tension. Returning to the concept of gesture mode, the structure of the standard piano keyboard gives us two simple and easily understandable starting points, white keys and black keys. The white mode, which I will be calling the quartz mode, renders degrees 119, 319, 519, 619, 819, 1019, 1219, 1319, 1519, 1719, and 1819 as the gesture space within which one can play. However, there's a catch. In the second cycle of the ditave, 1219 is replaced with 1119. The third deviates even further by replacing 519 with 419 and 1719 with 1619. This demonstrates that quartz resists being classified as a scale in the traditional sense. It can be analyzed as a kind of shuffling MOS of 8 large, 3 small, but this simply restates the original problem through a new lens. Theory, and thus practice, is once again in conflict with instrument form only this time the theory in question is more atypical. For further emphasis, here are the first six cycles of quartz in 19 EDO. As we can see, the way the large and small steps reorganize the harmonic structure continually makes traditional analysis, for example, the common practice assumption of octave equivalence, difficult and cumbersome. Ascending up the pattern gradually flattens all but three steps, 619, 1319, and 1819, while the 6th cycle adds an extra step, which results in the 7th cycle being misaligned. All of these features combine to create a scale where each repetition will have different intervallic relationships between steps, and each pitch class will change functionality as they fall in different places within the structure of the scale pattern. This is why conceptualizing chords as a gesture mode is a more robust approach in this case. Physicality is the most open avenue for musical exploration within the given parameters. Instrument form is the most intuitively consistent structure. A chord shape or melodic line can be moved by instrument equave, meaning the point where the instrument's form achieves equivalence, for example, C3 to C4, and be gesturally equivalent but not theoretically. Despite this lack of theoretical equivalence, the resulting gestures will still be musically coherent and or valid by virtue of adherence to chords. Now let's explore the black mode, obsidian mode from now on. I will still be assuming that 119 is mapped onto a C key, meaning that the first cycle of obsidian will start on 219 for this hypothetical. Here's what that looks like. Notice that in Obsidian, the pattern starts as 3 large, 5 small, but morphs into 4 large, 4 small on the 4th cycle, only to return to 3 large, 5 small on the 5th and 6th. This causes the equave of the mode to shift from 219 to 319, which then cascades into the 6th cycle ending on 119. While the same ideas apply here as due to quartz, 
This also presents an opportunity to discuss how a GI approach interfaces with other tuning systems. In this scenario, we're working within a system where each step is equally spaced, which generally allows for simpler harmonic analysis. This makes the strange features of these patterns less problematic from a traditional harmonic perspective. So what if we were to substitute 19 EDO for another unequal tuning? Let's swap in a non-octave JI, just intonation tuning, that I will call Chilin, for no reason other than for ease of speech, to demonstrate. Chilin is a 15-step tuning created by an arbitrary pattern of prime numbers in the denominator of the ratios. 17, 11, 7, 17, 5, repeating thrice, with the equiv set on 9 over 5. Here are the specifics with set values in brackets. As will be the case for every tuning, mapping Chi Lin onto a standard piano keyboard presents an entirely different set of challenges and incoherencies when viewed from the traditional perspective. Now there isn't even a ditave that one can fail to reach. The closest approximation is 36 keys away, C3 to C6, and is a 4 over 1 that is 1.018 cents sharp. In other words, not even a truly pure double ditave anyway. The step sizes also vary from step to step, meaning the intervallic relationship between any two pitches will be individualized to those two pitches in specific, with some nuances. Some will share intervallic relationships by mathematical coincidence, for example, ascending five steps from the second and third degree, 8 over 17 to 21 over 17, and 12 over 11 to 14 over 11 yields a 7 over 6 interval for both, while still others will be similarly spaced but not quite the same. For example, ascending by 1 from the 6th degree, 6 over 5 to 21 over 17, is 35 over 34, while ascending by 1 from the 7th degree, 21 over 17 to 14 over 11, is 34 over 33. It should also be mentioned that Chilin is relatively low in complexity compared to some approaches to J.I. temperament. All of this is to say that even a single incredibly narrow glimpse into a tuning reveals that each contains a lifetime's worth of harmonic possibilities. It can be difficult to acclimate when starting from a common practice methodology. It can be especially daunting, it can also be quite exciting admittedly, when confronted with the reality that said process of acclimation must be repeated with unique challenges for each scenario. GI in this case allows one to onboard oneself to the goal of making music more smoothly and immediately in the initial stage, which then enables the choice to pivot towards more traditional frameworks, more advanced gestural exploration, some combination of methods, or one's own entirely idiosyncratic process. Having done this analysis, now seems like a good a time as any to briefly discuss how we can apply these ideas to polysystemic music. Quartz and Obsidian, whether used to explore 19EDO, Chilin, or any other tuning system, are physically fixed modes. Gestures practiced through these gesture modes are transposable no matter the boundaries of pitch space because the instrument form we are mapping onto is a constant point of stability. This means that polysystemic composition and improvisational approaches can be thematically conjoined via gestural equivalences formed out of the gesture modes found not only on the piano, but any instrument form. Gestural motifs serve as vessels for musical continuity and coherence. GI isn't just about Zen harmonics, however. It's meant to be applicable regardless of systemic and theoretical approach. So for the next example, let's use a regular six string guitar in standard tuning, E, A, D, G, B, E. Since one's options for changing tuning system in a Zen harmonic sense are more limited on a guitar due to the nature of fixed fret positioning, the application of these ideas will be more stylistic and thus informal. This is also due to the guitar's form being less easily divided into separate gesture modes than the piano. While it is possible to play along a single string or across a single fret, as mentioned earlier, these modes are not particularly practical when treated as distinct from one another. Guitarists spend much more time focused on shapes relative to other instruments, with the majority of scales consisting of two basic patterns, sometimes with slight modifications that usually come in the form of subtraction. I'll call these IMP, index middle pinky, and IRP, index ring pinky. 
For example, the typical Phrygian mode shape can be deconstructed into the following. For those who may not be familiar, this is notated using a variation on guitar tablature. The bottom line is the low E string, sixth string, with the top line being the high E string, first string. The IMP and IRP notation assumes that each finger is assigned to corresponding frets consecutively from the starting point. If we start on the fifth fret to demonstrate, I equals fifth, M equals sixth, R equals seventh, P equals eighth. So IMP equals 568, and IRP equals 578. For scale shapes that occupy more than four frets, I'll be notating with either a plus N or minus N to indicate the shift in position. Here are Aeolian and Mixolydian shapes with frets in brackets. Note that this notation scheme always assumes that if a shape shifts positions, it will return to the original position as shown in the Aeolian example, unless stated otherwise as in the Mixolydian example. It's also worth acknowledging that these are not the only modal shapes that exist on guitar. Another popular method is three notes per string. However, I won't be using those shapes in my examples because I personally feel that they are not as musically intuitive. A simple entry point into GI from this foundation is a method of gesture construction that I'm going to call stretch and compress, which amounts to taking segments of existing shapes and either stretching or compressing them by shifting individual finger placements. This goes for both shapes that move along a single string and shapes that move across multiple strings. The results of this exploration, whether done loosely or systematically, will regardless deliver multiple segments of shapes that can then be applied, in whole or in part, anywhere along the fretboard to construct gestures. Here are a small collection of stretched examples using Lydian as a base. Finger placements that have been altered will only be altered by one fret and will be shown in parentheses. Admittedly, some of these shape segments are used in the three note per string variations mentioned earlier. Others will already be found, in an intervallic sense if not in terms of shape, in common non-diatonic scales such as the blues scale, the half hold diminished scale, or the various bebop scales. While others still will be transpositions of traditional shapes from across strings to along A string or vice versa. However, Continued repetition of this process will yield results that gradually drift further away from familiar shapes and into new territory. There are many options for iterating upon this initial exploration of this concept, as the boundaries on how many times and how far one can stretch or compress a finger placement within a given shape are entirely physical in nature. They are defined entirely by the guitarist's ability to splay their fingers to accurately reach specific frets, or in the case of compression, the narrowness of the fret positioning on the instrument. Combining this approach with positional shifting, advanced guitar-specific techniques like sweep picking or right hand tapping, external hardware and software like a looper pedal or a DAW, and or any other musical object allows for a huge breadth of gestural possibilities. Even within the relatively small scope of 12 EDO, there are many interesting varieties of scale, chord, and arpeggio shapes, both irrational and systematic. The rules of music were not formed in our brains, but in the resonance chambers of our bodies. This quote comes from the back cover of W.A. Matthews' book, The Harmonic Experience, 
and I bring it up in order to re-emphasize some earlier points, draw a through-line connection between the various elements that constitute GI, and perhaps most importantly find a way to articulate an idea that has so far escaped my elucidation skills. If I attempt to oversimplify everything I've said so far into a single sentence, it would be this. Gestural instrumentality is ultimately about the interconnectivity of physicalities in music. The interconnection between human anatomy and instrument ergonomics, acoustic phenomena, sense perception, and onward into further subtopics like the practice of contact improvisation in dance, or a deeper analysis of conducting from a GI perspective that I don't have the capacity to delve into for right now. I hope that others will feel inspired to take up these ideas and explore further from the foundation that I've attempted to lay out in this video. However, I want to again stress that it is paramount that we are guided by all of our senses in this pursuit. The gestures that constitute and construct music are not executed exclusively with one's sense of touch. They are also informed by the act of listening, like how the banks of a river direct the flow of the water. So let's return to that old adage, music is about listening. It's not entirely wrong, but it's also too simplistic. Hearing is certainly a primary sense through which we experience music, but it isn't the only sense. The senses of touch and sight and even smell if one is feeling daring, are and should be understood to be interwoven into the music making process as they allow one to achieve a more holistic understanding of artistic potential. Again, interconnectivity of physicalities. Perhaps this will become more clear with an example that is also a common occurrence, the jazz improviser on the stage of a club. Regardless of which instrument they play, whether it be trumpet, saxophone, piano, guitar, or any other, the performer is usually expected to take great care to consider the chord progression of the tune they are improvising on. A good soloist will both highlight and extend the harmony in a way that is musically appropriate, but also demonstrates their individual creativity, transforming the tune into a spontaneous dialogue between themselves and the rest of the band. If one wishes to stop their analysis there, they'll still find a near endless depth and dimensionality that makes jazz such a compelling art form. But for me, there's more to it. The best improvisers, in my view, are the ones who react to and incorporate into their solos not just their sonic environment, though that is still critically important, but their visual and tactile environments as well. One should take into account the temperature of the room, not just for practical reasons, cold fingers move slowly after all, but also because of the subtle emotional reactions that we have to temperature, both in a literal sense and in the metaphorical associative sense given to us by culture. The same goes for the lighting, the movements and spacing of both the audience and the band, and so on. Each solo is already a unique musical object. But that moment when one crafts their improvisations using all of the materials the world provides, that singular rare moment where skill and knowledge perfectly conjoins with intuition is the real magic of music. To be clear, this also applies to composition, but I don't conceive of improvisation and composition as meaningfully different domains merely two aspects of a single larger domain, ones that regularly intermingle anyway. Let's imagine ourselves standing on the side of an American freeway. Three or maybe four lanes of rubber on asphalt, engines running, horns honking, and so on in two directions. It's a cacophony. We hear these sounds all the time, but we rarely perceive them as music. This isn't surprising given that even the more inclusively minded ontologies of music tend to posit that music is sound presented in a musical context. A field recording of our imagined freeway played back on a music streaming platform or cassette tape is music, but the sounds in and of themselves are not. This is reliant on the various social technologies, such as presentation in a performance space, for example, that support a musical object's designation as such. This is also commonly understood as one of the primary subtextual messages of John Cage's 433, a piece so famous that it's almost passé to even mention it. My interpretation is slightly different, though certainly not unique. 
the freeway becomes a piece of music not when presented as such, but when perceived as such. Presentation is merely an aid and one that is not truly necessary at that. It is still true that sound in and of itself is not music. It is transformed into music when the instrument that is the human body molds it into rhythm and harmony. The source of musicality is not the acoustic phenomena happening around us. It is the somatic processes that our bodies perform to interpret them. As Matthew put it, the resonance chambers of our bodies. Finally, I feel it important to reiterate that I haven't come even close to fully examining the ideas laid out in this video. I've already mentioned the lack of rhythmic analysis, but beyond that there are also many instruments that I cannot fully explore in this context due to my lack of knowledge and or experience with them. The same can be said for the granular differences between similar instrument forms, for example, the piano as compared to the pipe organ. That being said, my hope is that the rough outlines I've described here can serve those who have that knowledge and experience in their own pursuits in GI. I posit that these conceptions of gesture and instrument present incredibly fertile ground that is currently underexplored in comparison to traditional theories. There is room to grow in a multitude of directions, some of which I've mentioned, some I have not, and some I certainly can't even think of. Most importantly, these multitudes are best probed through actual musical practice, developed in venues, rehearsal rooms, and both professional and home studios, with instruments in hand and or DAW open and record enabled. My hope is that GI can be an artistic tool for both the master and the student, regardless of tradition, instruments or instruments of choice, aesthetic goals, or access to resources. That by giving it a name, anyone will be able to more easily understand a previously unspoken driver of their musicality in a nuanced way. As I said in the introduction to this essay, this is almost certainly not a truly novel idea. Individual elements of it appear in various times and places across music history. For example, Arnie Cox uses Modest Mazorsky's Great Gate of Kiev from Pictures at an Exhibition to discuss the mimetic hypothesis, while Don Van Villey, more commonly known as Captain Beefheart, famously wrote the initial sketches of the 28 songs on Trout Mask Replica by mashing on a piano. And the North Indian Hindustani tradition designates specific times of day and even seasons for each raga. It's also something that I have personally seen manifest on the periphery of musical thought and expression in many scenarios but was, and still is in many ways, difficult to articulate and thus comprehend. I am merely collating disparate threads into a larger tapestry of application. And if this essay has in any small way helped to build the foundation that will facilitate the articulation and comprehension of that tapestry, then I've accomplished my goal. Thank you. Mm -hmm.